Many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, how do I take my commander deck to the next level? Be you a newer player looking to upgrade your pre-con, or a long-time player who's looking for some spicier gameplay, powering up your commander deck is a fun and exciting part of the game. Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. You know, I'm going to assume that at this point, you're already past the learning phase, and that you've probably already made some changes to your pre-constructed deck, or perhaps have already built your own commander deck from scratch. Good job. This video isn't about taking out Thantis, the Warweaver, and Gaius, Waker of Corpses, out of your Lord Windgrace precon, and replacing them with cards that actually synergize with the deck's intended strategy. <laughs> no, this video is actually about how to take that Lord Windgrace deck to the next level so that it can battle with the best. Well, not the best, I guess that would be CEDH, but it is about putting your deck on par with the spikier and more optimized decks in your playgroup. And while this video will touch on lowering your mana curve, it'll be more focused on improving the overall quality of three types of cards nearly every deck plays. Win conditions, removal, and lands. Let's start with win conditions. All games of Magic the Gathering must come to an end. With the exception of certain players who would prefer to dirtle all day long, most of us want to see our games come to a satisfying close. Well, satisfying for us anyway. To do that, we need our win conditions. These can range from combat-related blowouts to mass damage spells to intricate combos. Each strategy is different. What they all have in common is the need to assemble the necessary pieces for victory. A single win condition in a deck is perfectly fine better than none, but what happens if it gets disassembled or you just can't find a necessary piece? When it comes to powering up your deck, your foremost goal is to make your win condition resilient. This requires both consistency and redundancy. Commander is a 100 card singleton format. This means that the chances of finding the piece you need is much tougher than most other formats. The need for card draw is therefore much higher than in any other format. There is a way to cheat the singleton rule in a way to Tutors. Tutors are cards that let you search your library for another card, sometimes with restrictions, sometimes without. Effectively, they act as extra copies of a given card in your deck. Commander was designed to be an inconsistent format, and several format luminaries have spoken out against tutors, but they remain legal and are undeniably powerful. Even with tutors, however, redundancy is of great importance. What happens when you cast the Crater Hoof Behemoth that you just tutored for with Eladomri's Call, only for it to be countered by an opponent's assert authority. If Crater Hoof Behemoth was your only overrun effect, then you're probably finished. On the other hand, if you have a Pathbreaker Ibex and an overwhelming Stampede in your deck as well, you still have a shot. While not exactly the same as having three copies of a Crater Hoof Behemoth in your deck, these redundancy cards are pretty close. The same goes for mass damage spells like Torment of Hailfire and Exsanguinate. Even when dealing with combos, it's good to have redundancy. Need an anointed procession to combo off with Gave, Guru of Spores? Consider running Parallel Lives as well. If you're running one of those combos that only has one option in your colors, then consider running a backup combo. When redundancy fails, Contingency is there to pick up the slack. Running alternative win conditions in your deck is never a bad idea if you're looking to improve your odds. Winning with Approach of the Second Sun may not sound ideal to you, but at least it ends the game. Much is made about power levels and win conditions, and while these subjects are important to discuss, it is also important to discuss the value of time, specifically your time. If you only run a single way to close out a game and that way is stopped, you could be stuck sitting at a table waiting for upwards of an hour, unable to do anything impactful, and that seems like quite a waste of your time. Avoid that by building in redundancies and contingencies into your deck. Okay, that's the flashy stuff. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty. 
Let's move on to our second category, removal. In Commander, we usually run two broad categories of removal, single target removal and mass target removal, or board wipes. Both are important to making sure your deck has a chance at victory. Mass removal has a tendency to be more effective in games of Commander, where it can lead to multiple players' boards. But single target removal has its place as well, destroying a single combo piece or exiling a particularly threatening creature without disrupting your own board or making enemies of your other opponents. When it comes to targeted removal, there are three things you should ask yourself. One, what is this card's mana value? Two, how many permanent types can it remove? Three, what other upsides and downsides does it provide? For the most part, you're going to want to run targeted removal at mana values of one, two, or three. At one mana, the removal spell will likely only target one permanent type, and that's just fine. One white mana to remove a Pathraiser of Ulamog with Path to Exile is a great rate. Nature's Claim can hit either an artifact or enchantment, making it an extremely efficient option. At the three mana value level, the spell should be able to remove any permanent type, with the possible exception of lands. Beast Within, Chaos Warp, and Generous Gift are all excellent removal spells, taking care of immediate threats with minimal downside. If you're in the right colors, Anguished Unmaking is arguably even better. The difficulty comes when a assessing two mana removal. Ideally, two mana removal should be able to hit at least three different things. Return to Nature is a reasonable choice, as it removes artifacts, enchantments, and cards in graveyards, while Doomblade is not, as it only hits creatures and non-black ones at that. Now, mana efficiency and potential targets aren't everything. Upsides and downsides make a big difference as well. Instant speed removal is better than sorcery speed removal, allowing you to act at the optimal moment. Exiling is better than destroying, as exiled cards are much harder to interact with. On the other hand, sometimes a downside renders a card unplayable. Deathmark may only be one mana, but it's too narrow in its focus, while the downside of sacrificing a creature or discarding a card from bone shards may just be too heavy a price to pay. Sometimes the incentives of what to play are based on your deck. If you're playing a deck that cares about creatures, paying a mana or two extra for a body on the battlefield is often worth it. In Carador, Ghost Chieftain, and Muldratha, the Gravetide decks, playing a Reclamation Sage over Return to Nature makes sense as it has the potential to be cast multiple times. If a spell does something relatively unique in a color, as Feed the Swarm does in black or Raven Form does in blue, that's a matter to consider as well. Paying close attention to what extra benefits a given removal spell offers can make a huge difference, but overall aim for low mana values and as many potential targets as possible. Mass removal or board wipes follow similar but slightly different rules than their cousins in the targeted removal category. Mana efficiency is still important, but it takes takes a back seat to versatility and asymmetry. Like with targeted removal, what mass removal can hit is key, but even that is secondary to whose permanence it hits. Wrath of God is a great board wipe the classic of the genre. For two generic and two white, it destroys all creatures and they can't be regenerated. As with most mass removal spells, it does not discriminate when it comes to which player's creatures it destroys. On the other hand, Cyclonic Rift, for six generic and a single blue mana, returns all non-land permanents its caster does not control to their owner's hands. That takes out your opponent's boards but leaves yours unscathed. Now, Cyclonic Rift is both on the top end when it comes to power and mana value, but there are many other mass removal spells that can leave you far better off than your opponents. If you're running a Voltron strategy based around your commander, Slash the Ranks may be just what you're looking for. If you're running a deck full of auras, consider Winds of Wrath. If you're running very few creatures but a lot of other permanents, then perhaps Vanquish the Horde or Damnation will be right up your alley. Cards like Astir Command, Merciless Eviction, and Toxic Deluge give your options on what to destroy, and that flexibility can be used to your benefit. Options are a good thing in Magic the Gathering. The ratio of single target removal to mass removal spells is a little tricky. I tend to run about twice as many single target removal spells as mass removal spells these days. When it comes to which ones to pick, pay close attention to what permanent types you use most heavily. Lots of creatures and not many artifacts? Lean a little heavier into targeted creature removal and artifact and enchantment board wipes. Got a ton of artifacts, but only a couple creatures? Do the opposite. Sometimes it's necessary to wipe the board clean, but whenever possible, make sure that's your opponent's board, not your own. All right, time for the last category we'll be talking about today, though it's hardly the least important. 
Lands. The foundation of every commander deck is its mana production. Lands are the fuel our spells need in order to push the game forward. I have frequently criticized Wizards of the Coast for the low quality of lands their commander precons have offered. And while this has improved slightly in recent releases, as a whole, they are still far from optimal. Guild gates and gain lands are fine color fixing in draft, but for commander, they hinder your game almost as much as they help. The key to a sturdy land base are lands that don't enter the battlefield tapped. In 1 and 2 color commander decks, the solution is quite simple. Run more basic lands. Though they only produce one color of mana, basic lands are cheap, efficient, and almost always enter the battlefield untapped. I'm looking at you, Archelos Lagoon Mystic. This is easy for monocolored decks, which will be running mostly basics anyway. But even in two color decks, basic lands tend to more than pull their weight. On turn 3, when you should probably be playing your first or second spell, what would you prefer? A land that can tap for two different colors, but not until your next turn? or an extra mana now so that you can cast your Cultivate or Ashnod's Altar. When it comes to three, four, and five color decks, this gets trickier, but you still have options. In three color decks, a handful of basics is probably still a good idea, but add to that some lands that don't always enter the battlefield tapped. There are, of course, the Shock Lands, Hain Lands, and even the OG Duels. But in recent years, some other great options have been printed. If you're running more than 10 basic lands, the Battle for Zendikar Tango Lands, Check Lands, and the Reveal Lands, such as Port Town and Frost Boil Snarl, make for solid inclusions. The recent cycle of lands from Innistrad Midnight Hunt and Innistrad Crimson Vow are about as good an option as any. And don't forget my friend Vince's favorite, Exotic Orchard. It comes in untapped and more often than not produces every single color of mana. Also, it costs about 30 cents. Or in Vince's case, 15 shillies and a half penny. I can only assume. Some tapped lands may be unavoidable, but the key to playing them is making sure they produce more than two colors. The old Alara Tarkir Trilands and the more recently printed Triomes are probably going to be necessary for all but the most expensive four and five color mana bases, and that's fine. A land entering the battlefield tapped is hardly the end of the world. It starts becoming a problem when, turn after turn, you remain one mana behind where you should be. For more information on building the land base for one, two, three, and five color decks, I have rather extensive videos here. While they do not include references to recent lands, their templates and formulas about the types of lands and the ratios of such lands is still completely accurate. A final note on utility lands. Unless they are doing something very powerful, like exiling an opponent's entire graveyard, or potentially fetching you to non-basic lands, utility lands should almost always enter the battlefield untapped. More often than not, they are taken away from your colors by being there, so the last thing you want is for them to slow you down as well. This video is by no means an exhaustively thorough or definitive guide to powering up your commander decks. I could go on all day about the minutia of card selection and incremental value, but as I've said before, time is valuable. Yours and mine. By making sure your strategy has ample redundancy and contingencies, your time will be better served. By making sure your removal works ideally for you, your time will be better served. By making sure your mana base can keep up with the curve, your time will be better served. And when your time is better served, you will spend more of it having fun, which is the point of playing games in the first place. And in that way, I hope very much this video has been of some help to you. You can help me out greatly just by remembering to subscribe, leaving a comment, and especially, especially, especially by watching just one more video of mine after this. That's that's what YouTube wants now. So, so like, subscribe, but just watch one more. Watch an old one. Scroll back. Pick, I don't know. But just if you do that, YouTube loves it. So I'll love you too.